Today's guest is an author, a speaker, a coach, a consultant, and the host of a podcast called Time Out for Mental Health, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other platforms. He worked at Fox for 14 years, climbing up his way to becoming a senior vice president of distribution. Welcome to the show, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Toby. I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm so happy to be speaking with you right now. And even much more, you know, before we start recording, talking to you and getting to know you better, you know, makes me even much more excited to be uh, to be speaking with you right now to even learn more about your story and everything that you've gone through so thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of mirror talk um as i said i would love to really learn more about um your dramatic personal story of surviving at attack living through severe depressive um or disorder um you know having you know this suicide attempts and addiction to drugs and alcohol so is it possible for you to please share this with me sure Sure. You know, I grew up in what I thought was a typical middle class household in America, Mm -hmm. in the Midwest. And um, what I didn't understand was that my parents yelling and screaming at me and my brother, uh, them hitting us physically and uh, abusing us mentally and emotionally, I did not understand that that was any different from any other person growing up. I thought that that's what happened in every household. Yet, when I left home to go to college, I looked back and did some self-discovery and found out that I was abused. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And that I was carrying around all these negative feelings. I my mother was so strong personality that I had to walk around on eggshells. I Mm. couldn't tell her everything that was going on in my life for fear that she would get upset and start yelling and screaming at me or worse, start hitting me. Mm. And same thing with my father. And um, thus I had, you know, I had these very, a lot of negativity, a lot of negativity inside of me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got to college, I had like a dozen guys from high school that I uh, was at college with at Georgetown University in Washington, Mm DC. And this was, this was in the seventies in the United States. So sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, all the way. And Mm -hmm. These guys introduced me to marijuana, and I'd never smoked before, and Mm -hmm. I was instantly attracted to it because it overcame, it numbed all my feelings, my negative feelings about Mm -hmm. what I was feeling about growing up, which was really the the beginning of my depression, but I didn't know it. I, Mm -hmm. I knew that that you know, by smoking so much marijuana that my grades went down. I was eating a lot of food. I didn't Mm -hmm. care about uh, school that much. And I contacted my brother and we, I asked him about it, you know, told him I needed help. He really Mm -hmm. much like my father couldn't respond uh, in an emotional way. And, 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 you know, give me any kind of um, direction. Now, at the same time, he was going through his own medical uh, stuff, so it was difficult for him to to really be present. But I just kept going with this smoking pot and got through school. I went to grad school at Ohio State University. I have a master's degree in sports management and started working in, in, in television and soon started working at a regional sports television here in Southern California, um, where we televise Lakers basketball and college sports and, and hockey and things like that. But at the same time, I was, I was just mired in smoking pot before work, 
lunchtime, on the way home. It was just a mess. And hmm. I knew that, that it wasn't right, but I was asking my doctors for help. I, 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 I told them, I, you know, everything wasn't right. Hmm. Some I told the truth, some I tried to hide it from. And hmm. thus, you know, it ended up to be 41 years of substance abuse when it came to marijuana. Hmm. And finally, after seeing about eight different doctors, I found a psychiatrist who sat me down and we met for every week for four months. And he did research on me. He asked me questions. And finally, after those four months, he diagnosed me properly with severe depressive disorder that's reoccurring. And he said he was kind of scared for me because not many people get through it. And I was just in the process of on my own trying to get sober from marijuana. And in the first six or nine months of, of getting sober from any drug or alcohol use, it's very difficult. And there was a time when I couldn't sleep for a matter of days, I was isolating and I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't see a reason to continue with life. And I went in the kitchen and took out the biggest butcher's knife I could find, fine. came back to my room and lined it up on my wrist. And, wow. you know, I kind of chickened out. I, I mm -hmm. said, to myself, you know, if I could go into the next room and push a button and it was over, I would do that. But going through, you know, cutting myself or I'm not into guns, so I'd never shoot myself. Um, I, I just couldn't do it. And I, at the time I had a, a dog and, you know, dogs are very, um, they're, they're like they say, man's greatest companion, and the dog's mm -hmm. love uh, really shifted my thinking, my mindset, such that I didn't want to. I didn't want my dog to have to go to a dog pound, and then he, you know, they'd probably kill him. Or I didn't want anybody in my family to uh, take care of my dog because they they wouldn't treat him like I did. So that was my justification for not not cutting myself. And it, it happened just about the time when my psychiatrist said, here's your diagnosis, severe depressive disorder that's reoccurring, and here's the remedy that I propose to you. And yeah. so for the next few months, we started and things got better and he, he tinkered with medication and I was still attending 12-step meetings and after about six or nine months I and still which is coming up on nine years next month I've never felt better in my life uh -huh. I'm, I'm much healthier I watch my health the reason mm -hmm. I watch my health is because right before I got sober I, I had a heart attack I was, I was in bed and it was three in the morning and I got up and my head felt like it was in an incinerator. It was so hot. And I yeah. went in the bathroom and I splashed some cold water on my face and I got back into bed. Nothing changed. I was, I was overheating. And I said, I guess that's when I call 911. So I called 911. Three minutes later, Emergency technicians are at my house. They take some tests. They ask if I have a heart condition. I said, not that I know of. And they said, well, you got one now, and we're going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Four hours later, I wake up in intensive care, and my primary care physician is smiling and saying, I'm really proud of you because you got here so quickly. We put a stent in your heart. And there is absolutely zero heart damage, wow, which, which is a total miracle. And, mm. and that's God. 
And yes. um, then I started paying attention to my health, not only physically, but my mental health. And I just saw how important that was. And then that's when I started to write my book because I didn't want anybody to have to go through what I went through. It was yes. so painful. I mean, I had, I had a great job. I was making a lot of money. I had friends all over the country, all over the world. I was attending all kinds of sports events. I, I, I was l living life large, but inside things were festering and I was not a happy camper, but I was keeping it to myself. I would always tell people everything's great, you know? And that's something that I speak to quite a bit is about man's masculinity. Mm -hmm. And even though I had studied masculinity and knew mm -hmm. intellectually what it was about, I was not practicing it because my mm -hmm. masculinity norms were so strong for my father and the media that I had to be like Superman, like Clint Eastwood. And I would never admit that something was wrong. And I would just, you know, suck it up, be tough. You know, I'll handle it on my own mm -hmm. until I finally got to that psychiatrist where I just laid everything out and he yeah. properly diagnosed me and I, I, I got on the right path. So that's the, that's the basis of my story. And it's gotten me on this path that I'm on today to help others, especially men with their mental health and their masculinity so that they can have happy and healthy relationships. Yes, thank you so, so much for sharing that with me. I was going through your article on LinkedIn, which was titled, um, or which is titled Life in a Bong, and you talked about, you know, your addiction to mar marijuana. So can you share with me um, how you are, able to you know overcome this addiction at the end how are you able to finally you know let go of this addiction to mar marijuana well my family suggested that i start attending 12-step meetings mm. so i did and i got myself i was lucky enough in the first week to ask a guy to sponsor me and to mm. take me through the program and somebody that I could talk to on a regular basis. And he helped guide me through this program. And I went to a lot of 12-step meetings, sometimes three times a day. Hmm. And I had to start my life over from, from the beginning because I didn't have any money. I didn't have a place to live. Um, I got divorced. My wife took the car. Um, and it was very difficult for me to get work at the beginning. Mm. So slowly, slowly, I just kept working this program, which I, I have so much love for the program that I'm in, the 12-step program, because it has given me a way of life, a way of living, a path to live on that includes being honest with myself and honest with others every day yes. mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a way to take a look at myself in a way of self-discovery mm -hmm. to not only look back at my entire life and see where my behavior was off track, but also on a daily basis at the end of the day, take inventory, take a look at what worked for me today and what didn't work. Yes. And sometimes, you know, when I get on the phone with my bank or, or, you know, the phone company and the service, it's like sometimes I'm waiting for hours and hours just to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I lose my cool. And that's the kind of behavior that I need to make note of and ask, you know, my, my higher power, the creator, to help guide me so that I don't do those behaviors anymore because mm -hmm. I really don't want to do that. It's yes. a knee, knee jerk reaction. I probably learned it from my mother and father 
and thought it was acceptable. But mm. I have to, you know, it's hard for me on my own to get rid of these behaviors. So I have to ask my creator for help and guide me down the right path. Mm. And that's that's been my savior is being around other men who have similar issues in drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we get together on a regular basis. There's a Monday through Friday daily meeting. There's Saturday and Sunday meetings. Mm -hmm. We get together before the meetings. We have the meeting. We go out for breakfast. We call each other. We text each other. We kid each other about our soccer teams. You know, if someone's doing good or bad, we, you know, we, we, we give them grief. I got a friend who's a Liverpool fan and I'm a Manchester mm. United fan. So we never agree on anything. But we're, <laughs> we're best of friends. You know, we love each other. So yeah. Yes. That's yes. what makes life uh, really special. And um, every day I feel like I'm closer and closer to my authentic self, mm. who, I, who I've meant to be. I've always yeah. wanted to help others, but I didn't know what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And I had to go down the black hole of life in order to understand who I really was and why, you know, God put me on this earth. Yes. And I'm yes. very happy now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's great. That's beautiful. And I understand much better what you wrote in your article on um, medium.com where you wrote that I'm not afraid to ask for help. It's a sign of strength, not weakness. And now from your story, I can see how, you know, asking for help, going for this 12 step program, you know, helped you to come out of the, or overcome that addiction um, and also gain a community, a healthy community that makes you, you know, even know the reason why you're alive and makes you a better person today. That's, that's beautiful. That's a wonderful lesson. That's great. Yeah. It, and it's a big problem in the world. I mean, look at, look at what's going on in the world. There are mm. shootings. There are people who are abusing alcohol and drugs and pills. Um, domestic violence. There's hate crimes. There's all kinds of just terrible behavior. And this is what happens when People have mental health issues and they don't pay attention to them and they think that they can handle it on their own and it goes unchecked. And what happens is because it goes unchecked, they start using, just like myself, alcohol, pills, violence, rape, sometimes suicide, mm. to numb themselves so that they don't have yeah. to feel those feelings. Yes. And this is the underlying cause of what's going on in our world today. Mm. And, you know, there's cause and effect. The effect is, you know, drinking and drugging and hate crimes and violence and fighting and shooting. But the yes. cause is underneath all of that is all of these mental health issues, which mm. I term it mental performance issues mm. because mental health has a stigma attached to it. For me personally, I think when I think mental health, I think about mental retardation. That's mm. a very negative connotation mm. when really we all have mental performance and we have to take a look at that mental performance on a regular basis, just like going to the doctor and getting a physical every year. Yeah. Why not get a mental performance checkup to, mm -hmm. to see what's going on inside our brain? And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. if, if we break our arm or leg, we can see that we are not physically fit and that we have yes. to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. But if inside your head, you, you have something wrong and you feel it, but you can't see it. And if you can't see it, you're like, eh, no big deal. I'll take care of it. It'll work out over time. Yeah. Well, there's nothing further from the truth. And I'm proof of that because mm -hmm. I was ruining my life for 41 years because I never got a, 
a true proper diagnosis of my mental health issue, which was depressive, severe depressive disorder that's reoccurring. <laughs> and then I got a remedy for it. Yeah. And this is my message to men is that, hey, the sooner you get help with any health issues, the healthier you're going to be, the happier you're going to be. Mm. When it comes to mental health, mental performance issues, it affects relationships. You know, yeah. you hear about men today and they term it toxic masculinity. Exactly. Guys yeah. who talk over women. Guys mm. whose ego are so big when they're with a woman, they just want to tell them how great they are. Mm. When, you know, a woman is, she wants to express to the man who she is and what's going yes. on with her. And all I, she doesn't want him to fix her. She doesn't want to hear that much about how grandiose he thinks he is, how much money he has, how many cars he has, how many mm. friends he has. The, the woman, she's in her own world. She's looking yes. for somebody to listen to her and to empathize with her and to let mm. her know that she's okay, just as she is. And mm. I always talk about men needing to understand their role in masculinity is to create a safe environment for a woman to be exactly who she is. Mm. Whatever that is. Mm. And to just listen and empathize mm. and care and be of service to that woman. Yeah. And that's when the two can communicate. And, you know, the man's got to zip it up about his ego and how strong he is and how great he is and how great his cars are. And listen to what this woman has to say and start a conversation so that both can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one, of the, one of the benefits of my sobriety is I had a woman come into my life who says she loves me. And I couldn't, I had plenty of women that were interested in me when I was acting out with marijuana. But I couldn't show up in the relationship because yeah. I was not present. I had, mm. I had these, these curtains around me, which were the marijuana smoke. Mm. And women wanted to go deeper in the relationship. And I, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand the communication cues mm. to understand, you know, what I needed to do. Mm. And that was sad. But now... For nine years, that's moved away, and I'm able to be present. Mm. I'm able to be myself. I don't care what people think about what I say because it's the truth. They can say what they want to say. They can criticize. Mm. I don't care. I've mm. lived it. I know it. Yeah. And, yes. if, and if they think their ego is big enough that they can judge me, well, that's up to them. That's not my problem. Yeah. Because, well, because I'm not God. You know, I can't judge others. I, you know, all I can do is do the best I can do. It's so amazing that you detail all of this in your book titled You Don't Have to Swallow Your Gun. Yeah, you, you put it in your personal story into this book. And this book um, speaks to the depression that you um, experienced, relationships, suicide, and how, you know, as you said already, how toxic um, masculinity um, affects our relationship or all relationships between men and women. How um, masculinity um, affects relationships between men and women. So um, can you tell me the inspiration behind you writing this book, why did you decide to, to write, you don't have to swallow your gun? I'll tell you why. A um, couple things. Number one, after I got sober, I didn't want anybody else to have to experience what I experienced. It was painful, mm. and I suffered terribly. I had to restart my life. Mm. Um, number two, um, 
I, I had three friends of mine who mm. I had over the course of a couple of years, I had coffee with them one week, like on a Wednesday. Mm. And on Monday, I got a phone call from another friend of ours. And he said, hey, did you hear the news about Jeff? And I said, no. And he said, well, Jeff hung himself Saturday. Ooh. And it, there's something that happens to me. I go numb for 24 mm. to 48 hours. It, mm. it takes me right off track. And I can't focus because my mind just dwells and ruminates on the fact that I was with this person a week before. Yeah. yeah. And I know it's not right that I, that I put a, a little blame on myself, that I could have done more, but it just bothers me. It, it bothered me to no end. And I, I was writing about, you know, depression and, and suicide. And I saw how masculinity is is what gets in between men and getting help. You know, the World Health Organization said before the pandemic that more than 300 million people suffer from depression in the world. Mm. But only half of those, 150 million, get treatment mm. for it. And most of those are men. And that's why... That's how I saw masculinity and the norms that men grow up with wanting to be this big, strong Clint Eastwood kind of guy mm. where they can handle anything was, mm. was a bunch of bullshit and that they needed to take the mask off. We all, as men, we wear a mask and we keep in, you know, who we really are. And, and it's rare when we take the mask mm. off and be real and tell the entire truth about who we are and what's going on. And I've learned by working with other men and being parts of men's groups that when I and others sit with other men and talk about our issues, yeah. we realize that we're not alone, that we're all facing the same issues, mm -hmm. that we all go through the same pains and suffering trying to make life, you know, the best we can. But we don't often trust other men with our, our secrets and our feelings and our emotions. We think they'll betray us. They'll tell our friends and we'll be called sissies or weak men. And they don't want that to get out. But if you can find a group of men that you trust, and you can share all of your issues, there's a certain power that comes from that, that you can go to them when you have issues and you come up against the wall against something and you're like, God, I don't know what to do. It's freaking me out. I need some help. I can call. I talk to one friend of mine, a male friend, every night, every day. And we catch up with each other. And we often talk about work, we talk about sports, but there's always an opportunity if we're going through something that we can talk about it together. Mm -hmm. Buddy's father, who I knew very well, passed away about a month ago. And, you know, I was there for him. I told him, hey, you want me to come to the memorial service? Do you want to talk? You want me to come to where you live, you know, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the power of men being together is that mm -hmm. they can help support each other to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to be. And that's what I want to share with other men is it's possible to work every day on what you need to work on. What's working, keep doing that, but what's not working and what, what you need to do to help 
get over those barriers and become yeah. the best version of yourself that you can be. Yes. And so far, what I've learned now is that, you know, we have to take off that mask as men, you know, be more vulnerable. And also we need to understand the power in, you know, community, like men supporting men, being able to speak with each other about our situations without um, having a fear of being judged or being called sissies, for example. So are there like some other ways or advice or, you know, tips that you could give us to avoid, you know, toxic um, masculinity? Well, the first thing is what I just mentioned, that um, mm. men have to find uh, other men to hang out with. Mm. A lot of times men, you know, they want to be with women. And like I said, their ego, when they're with a woman, they start mm. dumping all their garbage on a woman. Mm. First off, a woman can't relate to what a man is going through. She's a woman. Mm. She's not a man. Mm. And a woman doesn't want to hear his problems. She wants him to listen to her and listen to what's going on in her life. Mm. That's the difference between men and women. You know, women are emotive. They're emotional. They talk about their issues with their their female friends mm. and they get power from that and this is what men need to do is is come together in in that trying to get more male friends and talk about real issues and be really honest yeah. the other thing is you know like i said we we all should be going to a primary care physician on an annual basis, at least mm -hmm. an annual basis and getting a physical to find out what's going on with our physical health. Mm -hmm. But we also can ask our doctor for a referral to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, anybody that can help explore What's going on inside a man's mind mm -hmm. to make sure that it's healthy? And if he needs help, to get the help that he needs. And there's, you know, there's many programs that can be put together for a man to get help. Yes, mm -hmm. he can talk to other men. He can take medication. He can go to counseling. He can pray, meditate, journal. 12-step programs, mm. you know, one of the things that, that I think is important for being a masculine man is having a spiritual connection, mm. whatever that is. You know, there's a million ways to connect spiritually. Some mm. people choose Buddhism. Some people go to church. Some people it's God. Some people it's 12-step programs, whatever it is. A man needs to have that grounding to quiet the mind so that he can hear what the creator is, is telling him what the next logical step in his life should be. Should be, yes. And it's yes. very tough for a man to sit still. But mm. That's when the messages are available I've heard that all of our messages, all of our answers are all around us mm. and that we just have to plug into the right channel, like on a radio station. You yeah. just got to tune it to the right channel to get that message. But so many times we're busy with the computer, social media, TV, going mm. out to eat, going out to drink, exercising, got mm. all this stuff but we're not paying attention, you know, spend some time with ourselves to see what's really going on. Yeah, inside, yes, yes. Wow, that's so beautiful. Like we have to spend time to really discover ourselves and know who we are. Yes. Self-discovery, yeah. yeah it's, uh, I, I have to do it every day. Mm. If I don't, that's when, you know, I start going at about 90 miles per hour over the speed limit of life. 
Yeah. And I'm just starting, you know, one thing after another, blah, 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 blah. And, and the next thing I know, I'm blowing up at somebody and I'm doing, making mistakes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I be, come down on myself. I get depressed. And, you know, I've got to balance myself. I have to force myself mm-hmm. to walk away from the computer mm-hmm. on a regular basis throughout the day to take a time out, to sit down, lay down be still, go for a walk, and get back to myself. Yeah. And let me tell you, sometimes I sit down in the computer at 8 a.m., and the next thing I know, it's 6 p.m., and mm. I'm frazzled. I'm, mm. I'm like a, you know, piece of garbage mm. because I didn't take time out. Yes. Mm. Yeah, so we have to learn to take time out, learn to program yourself and space things out and don't overburden yourself with a lot of work or stress and things like that. Yeah, yep. yes. Yeah, so um, you, you host a podcast called um, Time Out for Mental Health. And I think this is a proper time to talk about it because you talk about, you know, taking time out in your, you know, your daily schedule. So can you tell me more about Time Out for Mental Health and um, what are listeners supposed to expect from it? Yeah, I... As after I wrote the book and I'm, uh, I decided that I wanted to do a podcast and I've got, um, we've done about 35 podcasts. It's available all over the world on Apple and Spotify and every place else. Mm-hmm. And there's a double meaning time out, meaning just what we talked about, taking the time to focus on your mental health and yourself. And also, we talk. I talk to a lot of sports figures and mm-hmm. thought leaders, and I've had guys from National Football League or uh, MMA fighters on to talk about their experiences and where mental health fits in to mm-hmm. let people know that it's okay to ask for help. And it's okay to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are other people who have gone through struggles just like myself. Mm -hmm. And the reason they got better was because they they reached out and asked for help. Mm -hmm. Even Mm -hmm. when they were this close to death, they found something to move them in the right direction. And so we talk to people about their depression experience, their experience with suicide or people in their family who committed suicide Mm -hmm. um, and, and masculinity and how important masculinity is um, to have healthy masculinity Mm -hmm. and, and practice that on a regular basis so that men can have, happier and healthier relationships not only at home but at work yeah yes wow that's beautiful so like for example if there's someone out there who is experiencing depression anxiety or suicidal thoughts what advice will you give such a person at this moment or face of his life well personally i'm available 24 7 anybody can email me hit my website Call me. All of my information is on my website, timcrass.com. T I M is Mary K R A S S dot com. Mm. Um, but the, the first stop should be the primary care physician mm. and take the mask off and be honest and tell them exactly what's going on. Mm. Your primary care physician will either take care of you right there or refer you to another specialist who can help your situation and help to improve your health, your your mental health, where your primary care physicians mainly focused on your physical health. But more and more, we're seeing more people getting help with their mental health. And we, you know, like I said, 150 million people in the world don't get help with depression. That's a big problem. That's a big number. 
people need to realize it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, yes. And, you know, how can friends and family of such affected person, you know, help in a situation? Like, for example, if someone comes to me, open up to me, you know, ask me a question or ask for help, how do, do, would you advise me to stand out or stand up for that person at that moment to help that person effectively to come out of whatever difficulties that they're having? Well, you know, we all ask each other, hey, how's it going? And everybody's mm. knee-jerk reaction is, oh, that's great. You know, everything's fine. Well, mm. that's really not the truth. And, the, and after they go through that scenario, then you have to say, okay, now tell me what's really going on. How do you feel? Are you feeling any angst, any anger, any issues, any problems? Mm. Tell me about it. And then just urge them to call their primary care physician and schedule an appointment so that mm. they can tell them exactly what's going on. And be honest. I have to learn, I learn to be honest with myself and be honest with others. And that's the mm. only way I can be my authentic self. So yeah. very important. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for everything you've been able to you know, share with me today. And thank you so much for, you know, sharing your personal story, you know, you know, this dramatic story that uh, experience that you had with other people to help them to overcome their depression, overcome their suicidal thoughts or, you know, whatever they are going through. So if there's anything else you would love to tell someone out there that we, we've not been able to discuss, what, what would that have been? Like, if, for example, if there was something you could have told your um, 20 year old self, for example, what, what would that have been? It would be uh, being honest with myself and others mm. and trusting myself and trusting in my creator. Mm. And, you know, just, I don't, I don't need extra food. I don't need extra stimulants. I don't mm. need drugs or alcohol. Mm. I'm so much happier without it. I feel like a real person. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate everything you shared with me. All your information, sorry, all your information and the link to your website will be placed in the show notes of this episode. So I encourage everyone to, you know, copy the link, click on the link, get across to you, listen to the podcast and be blessed by everything that you, you do and offer to the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toby. It was great spending time with you. Anytime. Let's keep in touch. We can help each other. Yes, I believe that. I believe that. Wow. You made it to the very end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'm grateful for your time, your love, and your contributions. Subscribe, like, review, and share this podcast. God bless you. Bye. Bye.